questions, Question Oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. After eight years in power, how much has the Government of Canada given in contracts to McKinsey? So now that the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we understand how important it is for Canadians to have a good deal. So that is the reason for which I've asked the Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister for Public Services and the President of the Treasury Board to follow up on these contracts to make sure that all rules have been followed and all parameters have been respected and to make sure that they are open and transparent with committees on what has been done and how it was done. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. needs a review. Can't he just ask how much his own government spent on contracts to this company? I mean, we're talking at least $120 million. I asked him this question five times the last time we, he was in this House. He was unable to answer. Perhaps the number is too high to count, but this is a company that's engulfed in scandals in France, that helped kill people in the United States and possibly in Canada through the opioid crisis, and helped foreign governments suppress their own people. Surely the Prime Minister would know how much he paid this company after eight years. How much? <laughs> the Right Honourable Prime Minister. As these contracts were, uh, for the large part, uh, signed and negotiated by uh, the public service, it's important that we actually be able to have uh, clarity on the answers, which is why I've asked the Minister of Public Services and the President of the Treasury Board uh, to look in carefully to make sure that Canadians did get uh, value for money and that all the rules and procedures were appropriately followed. Uh, the Ministers, of course, uh, will be sharing that information with committees and with all parliamentarians. It's important that Canadians uh, see uh, exactly how uh, government is investing their money. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. He says that the public servants recruited uh, McKinsey and its managing director, Dominic Barton. Well, that's not what he said before. And I quote, I met the leaders of major corporations from around the world, and one thing they all had in common, they all knew Dominic. I came to appreciate, maybe even envy, Dominic's contact list. So I recruited him, far from having public servants do it. In fact, public servants say they have no idea what McKinsey actually did for all this money. So given that he recruited this company, how much should he pay them? The Honourable, Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, over our time in office, I have been touched by seeing how many Canadians of extraordinary backgrounds have put their hands up and offered to serve their country, to contribute uh, to Canadian success and contribute uh, to governments. And uh, Dominic Barton has certainly uh, served his country in many ways, including uh, by being an outstanding ambassador to China. In regards to contracts uh, assigned uh, to McKinsey uh, by the Public Service, as I said, we are following up on uh, how those contracts were uh, chosen, allocated, and uh, and fulfilled. Can I continue? I just want to remind the honourable members to look at their whips and follow their instructions. The honourable leader of the opposition. He always blames everybody else for his actions after eight years in government. He never takes responsibility. So now he's blaming the public servants for paying over $120 million to his friends at McKinsey. But here's what the public servants told the media. We had a few presentations on very ger generic, completely vapid stuff. There were nice colors, nice presentations, and they said they would revolutionize everything. But in the end, we have no idea what they did. Well, what they did is get over $120 million. We still don't know exactly how much. So what was the total, Mr. Prime Minister? <laughs> The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I said, uh, the ministers uh, are appropriately looking into that to make sure all rules are followed. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, uh, as we move forward, we're focused on Canadians right now and the need uh, to support Canadians who are going through a really difficult time, whether it's grocery prices, whether it's uh, gas, whether it's uh, paying their rents. That's why we've stepped up with direct supports for Canadians. We'll continue to. And we certainly hope that Conservatives, uh, you know, putting aside their opposition to more support for Canadians who are renting or 
more support so people can send their kids to the dentist. We'll step up and support on child care, on disability, and on other investments that support Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, after eight years in power, rents have doubled from 1000 to 2000 Monthly mortgage payments have doubled from 1500 to well over $3,000. One in five Canadians are skipping meals and half of Canadians are cutting groceries because of the food price inflation that his carbon tax has caused. And where's the money going? $15 billion for high-priced consultants like McKinsey. Now, when he hired McKinsey, he announced it was for $1 a year up to at least $120 million a year. How do you explain that? Is it just inflation? <laughs> I just want to remind the honourable members to place their questions through the speaker, not to the speaker. And you can't do indirectly what you can't do directly. The right honourable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, while the Conservative Party focuses on schoolyard taunts, we're going to stay focused on being there for Canadians. Uh, we've stepped up uh, with investments that have helped Canadians significantly through this difficult time. We know people are facing tough times, and that's why we continue to step up with a doubling of the GST credit over six months, uh, with moving forward on support for low-income renters, and uh, so that all families can send their kids to the dentist. Unfortunately and inexplicably, despite all his rhetoric, the Leader of the opposition stood against those last two measures. Uh, we are hoping that they are going to see that investing and supporting Canadians, not abandoning the middle class, is what we need from them. The Honourable Member for Belo Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After recent news, after tensions with the arrival of the representative chosen by the Prime Minister, who I met at uh, lunch, after past uh, statements that may have been regretted. D there has been polarization between Quebec and Canada. If the Prime Minister wishes there to be better communication between communities, will he admit that he did things incorrectly? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, very clearly, there are difficult conversations to have as a society. It's always the case, be it against systemic racism throughout the country, be it to defend fundamental rights and freedoms, there are always difficult and important discussions to have. And I believe that everyone understands that rhetoric and exaggerations from any front does not help. And that is the reason for which we have appointed a special representative to fight against Islamophobia, who I know will acquit herself brilliantly through these conversations. The Honourable Member for Bailey Chambly. Well, it's important, yes, but it should not be that difficult in order to reduce polarization, to truly work towards mutual understanding, to mitigate the terrible consequences of recent decisions. Can the Prime Minister calm things and admit before this chamber and confirm before this chamber that Bill 21 is not Islamophobic? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, for years now, I've expressed my concern that certain bills, including Bill 21, could flout individual fun fundamental individual freedoms. I know that this is not an opinion shared by all, but I hope, and I see that my honorable colleague is, is, uh, takes this to heart as well, I believe that we can have responsible and difficult conversations to bring people together rather than to create clefts and divisions. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. You or your loved one falls, falls sick or your mom needs a surgery, you need nurses in the hospital to provide that care. Yeah. Since the Prime Minister has been elected, the, sh the shortage of nurses was 5,800. Now the shortage for nursing is 29,000 positions. The situation has gotten a lot worse, not better. The Prime Minister promised to hire more nurses, but hasn't done that. And when Conservative premiers want to privatize for profit our services, he encourages it and celebrates it. 
Why has the nursing shortage gotten worse, not better, with the Prime Minister? Yeah. Here is the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, through the depths of the pandemic, this federal government stepped up with over $72 billion in extra investments in health care across the country, on top of the 40 or so billion dollars a year we send to the provinces for delivery of health care, to hire nurses, to uh, ensure proper health care delivery across the country. One of the things that we saw during the pandemic is there is a need to continue and even increase working together to ensure that Canadians get the best possible medical services across the country. That's why we'll be sitting down with the provinces next week to talk about the future of health care services across this country. Well, member for Burnaby South. When the Prime Minister came to power, there was a shortage of 5.8 thousand nurses. Now it's five times worse. He promised to hire more, but this promise has been shattered. When provincial premiers seek to privatize, privatize our healthcare system, they call that innovation. Why is the Prime Minister making the healthcare crisis even worse instead of making it better? The right honourable Prime Minister. Quite the contrary, Mr. Speaker. We saw the challenges against which Canadians were during the pandemic. We invested 72 billion extra dollars in healthcare federally, on top of the 40 billion that were already being sent every year to the provinces to deliver healthcare services. We know that we need to do more, and that is the reason for which we will sit around the table with the provinces next week to talk about the way how more investment and more cooperation will allow us to deliver better service for Canadians throughout the country in our public service and system, of course. Mr. Speaker, we know that the insiders at McKinsey got rich, and we know that Canadians got 40-year highs in inflation, but after eight years of this Prime Minister, $15 billion for consultants. What did Canadians get? They got record food bank visits, he doubled their rent, he doubled their mortgage payments. The Prime Minister says that things have never been better. And for him and his friends, that's true. But over here in the real world, Canadians are struggling. So will the Prime Minister show some humility, admit there's a problem, and start working for ordinary Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. That might be a little more credible coming from the Conservatives that they hadn't voted against uh, benefits uh, for low-income renters just a few months ago. If they hadn't voted against extra support so families who couldn't afford to send their kids to the dentist could finally send them to the dentist. Mr. Speaker, what we hear from the Conservative Party is uh, promotion of cuts, promotion of austerity, instead of stepping up and actually investing in the support that Canadians need. We managed to deliver targeted supports in a way that maintains our strong fiscal position so that uh, we're coming through these difficult times by leaning on each other as we always do. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, I know that he doesn't want to talk about his friends at McKinsey. The only person in Canada who, think, who thinks things are good is the Prime Minister. But after eight long years, long years, and the billions that he's bragging about has given Canadians long lineups at airports, long immigration backlogs that number into the millions, long wait times for a passport. SNC Lavalin, We Charity, McKinsey, the list goes on and on. And at every point, he's working for well-connected insiders and leaving the middle class behind. Will he finally take responsibility for that? The right honourable prime minister. As uh, Conservatives continue to blame this government for everything from COVID-19 to the war in Ukraine, we're going to continue to be there to invest in Canadians, to support people through uh, the difficult times they're going through. That's why we have consistently stepped up to invest in Canadians, despite Conservatives screaming every day that we were doing too much for Canadians, that we were helping too much through this pandemic. The reality is we stepped up and our economy bounced back strongly, and we're going to continue to step up as Canadians face difficult times with inflation and rising interest rates. We will be there for Canadians despite the Conservatives calling for cuts. The Honourable Member for Charles-Bourg-Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, 
Let's just talk about what we know about the McKinsey affair. We know that the Prime Minister, the Minister for Finance and Dominic Barton are great friends. We know that their friendship was also a reason for which Mr. Barton was able to secure nearly $117 million in federal government contracts for McKinsey. Since uh, eight years ago, we know that all the contracts given to McKinsey were for work that our public servants could have done in-house. But now, we know that the Prime Minister no longer trusts his own public servants. Why is that? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Like I said, Mr. Speaker, the two uh, Germain ministers are doing follow-ups to make sure that Canadians got a good deal and that these contracts followed all rules and met the parameters established to make sure that, government, that contracts granted by government are judicious. We will continue not only to be transparent with people, we will also continue to invest in the middle class. The question is why they were against dental care, why the Conservatives were against low-income renters. Why have the Conservatives abandoned the middle class? The Right Honourable, uh, the Honourable Member for Charlebourg at Saint Charles. The Prime Minister is always trying to uh, divert the debate, but there is a lack of trust in the government in the public service. After appointing Isabelle Udon to the head of the Business Development Bank of Canada, the first thing she did was to award a contract of $4.9 million to McKinsey to do work that could have been done in-house at the BDC. BDC staff are so frustrated that they mentioned it, they rose up against it. Why grant all these contracts when the, go when the work could be done in-house in the government? The right honourable Prime Minister, I already answered this question, Mr Speaker. The reality of the matter is that we are currently experiencing very difficult times for Canadians. As a government, we are here to help them. We are here to help them by doubling tax credits on GST during six months. We are here to help them for, with dental care for those who cannot send their children to a dentist, for example. We are also helping low-income renters. Unfortunately, the Conservative Party has systematically voted against these initiatives. They, pre they, pre they prefer austerity to investments that will help Canadians weather the storm. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Today, the Prime Minister's friend Dominic Barton will appear before the Government Operations Committee. Over the last eight years, Canadians have been struggling, but Dominic Barton's former company has cashed at least $100 million worth of government checks for consulting services. Now, I will be asking Dominic Barton about his involvement in the opioid crisis. While Barton was advising the Prime Minister and while his company was collecting Canadian government contracts, they were advising Purdue Pharma on how to turbocharge opioid sales. During their time working together, did the Prime Minister ever ask Dominic Barton about his work turbocharging opioid sales? Yeah. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. I know Mr. Barton is looking forward to appearing at committee and answering any and all those questions. What I will uh, highlight uh, is that uh, as a government, we will continue to stay grounded in science and facts and data as we address the terrible opioid e epidemic across this country, where conservatives dig into random, conserva uh, con uh, random conspiracy theories and ignore science and evidence on how to keep people safe through the opioid e epidemic. We are going to continue to step up uh, with with a harm reduction approach, with an approach that puts science first and that keeps Canadians safe through this terrible ordeal. Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, McKinsey's involvement in the opioid crisis is not a conspiracy theory. It's in the New York Times. The Prime Minister should read the stories about how, under Dominic Barton, McKinsey incredibly advised Purdue Pharma on a scheme to pay pharmacists for overdoses, paying pharmacists for overdoses. I asked a specific question for the Prime Minister about his conversations with Dominic Barton, and I think families deserve an answer. Did the Prime Minister ever ask Dominic Barton about his work with Purdue Pharma, yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, with so many conspiracy theories rattling around the Conservative caucus, one can understand uh, where the member would misunderstand me. I was referring uh, to the approach that uh, the Conservative leader is taking against harm reduction, against science and evidence in supporting people uh, facing with the uh, tragedies of the opioid epidemic. We need to put a public health uh, lens on this. We need to be grounded in science and data as we look to care for the most vulnerable, uh, not have uh, 
have a criminal approach uh, and not uh, be grounded in uh, things that sound good but actually will be harming the most vulnerable people. That's what I was calling out on the Conservative side. Right. The Honourable Member for Baylor Chambly. Mr. Speaker, given that it's a question of building bridges, some of his members go to the front in Quebec to defend his most indefensible positions. Because members for Saint-Maurice Chamblain Honoré Mercier expressed reserves. I would like to hear what the Prime Minister has to say or said to his Quebec MPs rather than uh, instead of just saying that he supported 100 percent his appointment. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am very proud to be part of the Liberal Party of Canada's Quebec caucus, and I would like to say that we are here for difficult conversations between us with Ca Quebecers and with Canadians. Islamophobia is a delicate question, I know, throughout the country, not just in Quebec. And that is the reason for which we are here, to dialogue with our colleagues, to talk about how we can create a better feeling of unity in Canada to be here. I was pleased to have been in Saint-Foy on Sunday and will continue to be here for the Muslim community. The Honourable Member for Belo Chambly. Mr. Speaker, if we separate the notion of secularism and racism, and given what he has proposed is between mediocre and terrible, and without judging someone's particular statements, it's the public that will make their decision, and without putting anyone on trial, I had a difficult, I have a difficult conversation for the Prime Minister. Why would he not meet with me to meet to create an alternative to the current mistakes? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, it is incumbent upon the opposition to oppose what the government does. Sometimes we agree, and sometimes we do not. On this side of the House, we know that we made the right choice in Amira El Hawabi as special representative against Islamophobia, and we support her in the very important work that she has to do in the months and the years to come. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. After eight years of this Prime Minister, mortgage payments have more than doubled from $1,500 a month to over $3,000 a month. After eight years of this Prime Minister, Rent has more than doubled from about 950 bucks to over $2,000. After eight years of this Prime Minister, a fifth of Canadians are skipping meals or cutting groceries because they can't afford the inflationary carbon tax he's imposed on our farmers. After eight years, 30,000 people have died of the hopelessness of drug addiction, egged on by McKinsey, which promoted the opioid crisis in this country. Why does he keep governing for, for the super rich instead of the ordinary Canadian? The right honourable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, over the past eight years, we have consistently stepped up for the middle class and people working hard to join it with a Canada child benefit uh, that Conservatives voted against. Uh, with child care agreements across the country that Conservatives campaigned against. Uh, with investments in uh, rental ben uh, benefits for low-income renters. Uh, with investments so that all families can uh, take their uh, kids to the, uh, to the dentist. Uh, these are the kinds of things we've invested in that that have not only benefited Canadians, but created a strong and growing economy. The Conservatives have had nothing to offer but a recommendation around Bitcoin. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Strong economy? It's like he's telling Canadians that they've never had it so good. Why doesn't he talk to the 1.5 million Canadians going to food banks in a given month, some of whom are asking food bank presidents for help committing suicide, not because they're sick, but because they're too hungry? It's as though he hasn't spoken to the 9 in 10 young people who don't own homes who believe they never will because mortgage payments have doubled under his watch. It's as though he has spo he's not spoken to the 30,000 families who've lost loved ones because of the record overdoses that have happened under his watch. Why would he take responsibility for this disaster? Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
been very, very clear that this government is very aware of the difficult times Canadians are facing uh, right now. That is why uh, we've stepped up with direct targeted supports for people who need it, why we continue uh, to invest in Canadians, even despite Conservative politicians continuing to call on us to do less, to spend less, to support people less. Uh, that is why they voted against support for the lowest income renters just a couple of months ago. That's why they voted against uh, support for families who couldn't afford to send their kids to the dentist. We will stay on the sides of Canadians while they abandon the middle class. Here. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. It's the middle class that is footing the bill. He who doubled our national debt by adding the debt, more debt than all other prime ministers combined, which caused inf the highest inflation rate in 40 years. The more he spends, the more Canadians have to foot the bill. It's the just inflation that's for which Canadians are footing the bill. And what do we get in counterpoint? A greater number of people that have to go to food banks, another growing class of poverty and more money for his friends at McKinsey. So how much money has McKinsey received? The right honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, what we note is that when the Conservatives speak about uh, Canadian challenges over the past few years, what they never mention is the pandemic. And it's perhaps because had the Conservatives been right, then no investments would have been made to support Canadians during the pandemic. There would have been thousands of SMEs going bankrupt, millions of Canadians not receiving the assistance necessary to uh, weather the storm of the pandemic. We invested while they were casting doubts on vaccines. We helped Canadians to weather the storm. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Me that says that this Prime Minister overspent, it's... Bill Morneau. Remember him? My old friend Bill Morneau. He's the one that said this Prime Minister spends too much. And the future Liberal leader, Mark Gar Carney, is the one who, along with the current Governor of the Bank of Canada, says that this overspending is contributing to inflation. Forty percent of the spending had nothing to do with COVID. In fact, much of it went to Liberal cronies and Liberal friends with uh, nearly doubling the amount of money that goes to high Price consultants. Consultants like McKenzie. If he has nothing to hide, one more chance. How much did he pay McKenzie? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, you know the Conservative leader is stumbling over himself when he starts quoting random Liberals. Uh, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, we will continue uh, to move forward. Listen to your whip. <laughs> right Honourable Prime Minister from the top, please. Hey! Able to lift the Conservatives out of the funk they seem to be in. So uh, uh, we're going to continue to stay focused on investing in Canadians. We're going to continue to stay focused on being there for people while Conservatives continue to push austerity and cuts and criticize us for having supported people through the pandemic. Uh, we're going to demonstrate that we understand that building a strong economy involves investing and supporting people, which is why uh, apparently they voted against uh, support for renters, uh, support for dental care for young kids. These are things that we disagree with them on. They will continue to try and fling mud. We will continue to stay focused on Canadians. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Everyone in this country should be able to find a home that meets their needs and that's in their budget. Sadly...
the Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Everyone in this country should be able to find a home that meets their family's needs, and it's in their budget. Sadly, that's not the case. People are struggling to find a home that they can afford. And the rent under this Prime Minister, since he's taken office, has gone up by 60%. It's a massive increase. But people are struggling. The Prime Minister hasn't built the homes he promised he would build, nor has he tackled speculation that's driving up the cost of housing. Why has the housing crisis gotten worse, not better, under this Prime Minister? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, we know that housing affordability is a real concern, and we continue to be committed to tackling it. It's why we've introduced the first-time homebuyer incentive, why we committed over $82 billion to the national housing strategy and supported the creation and repair of almost half a million homes. We announced a rent-to-home program. We've helped more than 2.6 million families get the housing they need, and we're working to ensure that every Canadian has an affordable place to call home. We understand, Mr. Speaker, there is more to do, but we are continuing to do it. Here, here. Member for Burnaby South. Tout le monde doit pouvoir avoir. Everyone should be able to find affordable housing. But unfortunately, that's not the case. It's harder and harder for people to pay their bills. Since this Prime Minister has been in, in power, rent has gone up 60 percent. That's a massive increase. The Prime Minister has promised to build more affordable housing, but has not done it. Why is the Prime Minister making the housing crisis worse? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as my colleague knows, the housing crisis is affecting a lot of people, and we will continue to address the problem. That is why we have created the incentive to buy a first property, and we have also invested billions of dollars in the national housing strategy. We are supporting construction and renovation of half a million units. And we are also supporting rent-to-buy programs. We are helping thousands of families to find the housing they need, and we will continue to do so. The Honourable Member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Mr. Speaker, when I talk to my neighbours in Mississauga Lakeshore, they expect their government to have their backs during tough times in a responsible way. They want us to promote economic growth to sustain programs that are important to them. They certainly don't want indiscriminate conservative cuts that puts them in harm's way. Mr. Prime Minister, please tell this House what is our plan to support the middle class and continue growing an economy that works for all Canadians. Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it is my great pleasure to congratulate the member from Mississauga Lakeshore for becoming the newest member of this House. His constituents can rest assured that we will take no lessons from the Conservative Party's records of austerity and cuts when it comes to supporting people. While this Conservative leader promotes Bitcoin to Canadians dealing with inflation. We've cut childcare fees in half across this country. We've eliminated the interest on student loans. We've made sure parents don't have to choose between buying groceries and taking their kids to the dentists. All measures that the Conservatives voted against. The Honourable Member for Haldeman Norfolk. Eight years of this Prime Minister's overspending has led to the current inflationary crisis. Canadians have never struggled more with paying for food, fuel and shelter. Former Minister Finance Minister Bill Morneau, former Bank Governor Mark Carney and the current Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklin all agree these Liberals have overspent and Canadians are suffering as a result. When will this Prime Minister rein in his inflationary spending so that life in Canada can once again become affordable? The right Honourable Prime Minister. That was the excuse Conservatives gave when they voted against rental benefits for the most vulnerable renters. That's what the excuse they gave when they said, no, we're not going to make sure that all families can send their kids to the dentist in this country. They said, oh no, that's too much spending. Mr. Speaker, we have the strongest balance sheet in the G7. We have an enviable fiscal position, and this government is choosing to use that to support Canadians in targeted ways that are going to help them through these difficult times, while Conservatives stand there and vote against it. Mr. Speaker, we'll take no lessons from them. The Honourable Member for Haldeman-Norfolk. 
this prime minister should learn the lesson that he has acted, he has not acted in the best interest of Canadians with eight years of wasteful inflationary spending. Now this government wants Canadians to just trust them and give them a blank check for $2 billion to invest in a company that does not even exist. Well, we heard that before, when they wasted $35 billion on an infrastructure bank that has not completed not even one project in six years. Will this Prime Minister admit that because his government wasted billions... Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, one of the areas in which I know the member opposite feels we wasted money over the past years is in procurement of vaccines, Mr. Speaker, in trusting science and evidence in our approach to keep people safe right across the, uh, right across the country. Indeed, uh, it has been shown that the approach she was pushing uh, during the pandemic would have resulted in tens of thousands of deaths more than we actually had and a much slower economic recovery. We made the choice during that pandemic to step up, to follow science, to be there for Canadians. That's exactly what we did. We can understand how she did. The Honourable Member for Belle Chasse, Les Ishmael Levy. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are struggling. Inflation is taking more and more away from their paychecks. 1.5 million people have had to go to food banks over the past month. Students are having to live in shelters. And pregnant mothers need to make the heart-rending choice of feeding themselves or their children. And what does this government have to say? Canadians have never had it so good. What will it take, Prime Minister, for you to understand what's going on with Canadians and their suffering? The right honourable Prime Minister. Well, let me be clear. Canadians are facing serious challenges. And that is why we have brought forward initiatives to help them, whether it be help for low-income renters, whether it be to help families send their kids to the dentist. Despite the rhetoric that I'm hearing from my colleague across the way, she voted against these concrete measures that could help mothers choose be not have to choose between sending their kids to the dentist and buying groceries. That's what we're doing to be there for Canadians. The Honourable Member. We don't need to spend more. We need to spend better. Mr. Speaker, according to the annual report on food prices, an average four-member family will have to spend $1,065 more on their groceries than in 2022. Canadian families are already struggling, and in 2023, more and more of them will just not be able to make ends meet. This government has been here for eight years. Can this Prime Minister look Canadians in the eye and tell them that they have nothing to complain about? the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, my honourable colleague just suggested that we need to spend better than helping families send their kids to the dentist. I mean, we could have a debate on that, but that's not the debate that our colleagues have chosen to have. The Conservatives are hoping that Canadians will not learn that they voted against helping kids go to the dentist. Instead, they want austerity. They want cuts. They think that that's how we're going to help Canadians face these challenges. On this side of the House, we don't agree, and we will continue to be there for Canadians, despite conservative austerity. The Honourable Member for Jonquière. <laughs> Was it me? Yes? Okay. Mr. Speaker, after years of assistance from Quebec, the provinces, and the Bloc Québécois, the Prime Minister has finally invited his counterparts to a meeting about health transfers on February 7th. The Prime Minister shouldn't make this a PR affair. February 7th should be the first day of ending the crisis. February 7th needs to be the day when the Prime Minister proves to patients and healthcare workers that we're starting to repair the health system. Not in 2024, not next spring, now. Will the Prime Minister bring his checkbook to the meeting? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, yes, we will be there with further investment in the health care system. That's what I've been saying for months and even years.
Canadians care about receiving quality health care. They want more for family care, mental health. They want better care in our ERs. We need to invest in the health care system, and I'm looking forward to sitting down with the provinces to move forward on this, to help Canadians throughout the country. The Honourable Member for Montcalm. Mr. Speaker, it seems that the Prime Minister is struggling to realize that the health care transfers are not a merely political issue. They are a human issue. Burned out nurses who are thinking of leaving the profession, people worried about their health who are on waiting lists, people who just can't get a doctor, these people are waiting for a concrete solution. And that means that we need a substantial and regular increase in federal funding. We're not talking about political games or a PR operation. After the meeting on Tuesday, will the Prime Minister finally end this chronic health underfunding? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, what Canadians don't want is arguments between the provinces and the federal government. What Canadians do want is that different levels of government work together to deliver better health care, and that's exactly what we're doing. Yes, there will be more money, but we also want results for Canadians. We want results in the form of more GPs, more help for uh, mental health care, more help in our ERs, and less delay for surgeries. We know what Canadians need. We are going to work together to deliver it. Honourable Member for Fundy Royal. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of a soft on crime Liberal government, Canada's justice system is badly broken. A young police officer shot and killed by someone with a lifetime firearms ban, a serious criminal history, and yet out on bail. The Liberals' broken bail system is putting Canadian lives at risk, yet this Justice Minister refuses to answer the call of all 13 Premiers and police associations across the country to reform the bail system. Will the Prime Minister take the opportunity today to do what his Justice Minister has refused to do and commit to reforming the Liberals' broken bail system. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the increase in violence in so many of our communities is heartbreaking to see and continues to be a priority for us to respond to. We will always look at what more we can do alongside the provinces, territories and municipalities. The Minister of Justice and Attorney General met with his counterparts and discussed this issue uh, just this past fall, and experts at the federal and provincial levels have been working together on bail reform since. The Minister has asked these experts to do whatever they can to speed up this work to make sure we're doing everything we can to keep Canadians safe. Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. Uh, Mr. Speaker, last fall the Liberals ce celebrated eliminating mandatory prison time for those convicted of sexual assault, and now a man convicted of raping a Quebec woman will get zero days in prison and instead wow. serve his sentence from the comforts of his home. <laughs> After eight years of Liberal government, Canada has become a place where men who rape women get zero days in prison. This is not justice, Mr. Speaker. Will the Prime Minister bring back mandatory prison time for rapists? Yeah. Thank you, right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, one of the strengths of our justice system is that there is a possibility for appeals uh, and for opinions to be scrutinized and reversed, and we uh, trust our, our justice system uh, in, this, uh, in this case and in all cases, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to ensure uh, that we are keeping people safe across this country. Uh, we continue to make investments where uh, Conservatives cut investments in policing and in our justice system. We're going to continue to invest uh, in, uh, in solutions that are going to keep people safe. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Lérable. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister falsely claims that he's a feminist, but after eight years of this government, violent crimes against women have never been so numerous. A Crown prosecutor had the courage to criticize the fact that a perpetrator of sexual assault in Quebec was, received a sentence of 20 months in the community because of the bill adopted here by the Liberals with support from the Bloc and the NDP. The Prime Minister and the Minister of Justice should be held accountable. Can the Prime Minister look victims in the eye and tell them that he's satisfied with this sentence? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have an arm's length justice system in this country. With with a system for appeals and various other procedures when people don't agree with the sentence. It's not up to politicians 
It's not up to politicians to state what they think. It's up to politicians to create the right conditions for public safety, and that's what we're doing and what we will continue to do with legislation to keep Canadians safe and to protect public safety. The Honourable Member for Madawaska Restigouche. Mr. Speaker, the pandemic laid bare systemic long-term problems in the long-term care system in Canada. Can the Prime Minister tell us what the government is doing to ensure that seniors have access to safe, reliable and high-quality long-term care centres throughout the country? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for Marawaska Restigouche for his hard work and for the question. Indeed, the pandemic has made us realize the challenges facing our seniors in long-term care throughout the country. That's why in 2021, I mandated the Minister of Health and the Minister for Seniors to create national standards on long-term care to ensure that seniors receive the care that they deserve. Now that that important step is over, I'm looking forward to seeing the legislation tabled when it is ready. Reads Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. After eight years of this Prime Minister, Canadians have never had it so bad, but Liberal insiders and high-priced consultants and friends of this Prime Minister have never had it so good. Just look at the Minister for International Trade. While Canadians were lined up at food banks, she had her BFF lined up to receive lucrative contracts that turned out to be illegal. That's a record fifth ethics violation for this Prime Minister and members of his Cabinet. Canadians want accountability. When will this Prime Minister ask for that Minister's resignation? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we support and respect the Commissioner and the work his office does. Uh, the, minister in, uh, the, uh, the Minister in question has taken responsibility and apologized. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Well, now it's time to respect taxpayers and Canadians and have some ministerial accountability across the aisle, and that means resignations of ministers who break Canadian law. But it's not a surprise from this Prime Minister because he's twice been found to have broken ethics laws in this country to help out his buddies and Liberal insiders. After eight years of this Prime Minister, you bet if you're a Liberal insider, things are looking pretty great, but not so for the rest of Canadians. So when will this this Prime Minister and these Liberals finally put Canadians first and put the corruption and law-breaking aside. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, while Conservatives engage in attacks, we're engaging uh, in supporting Canadians directly with things uh, that uh, Conservatives have opposed. Things like delivering rental supports uh, to the lowest income rentals, uh, which renters, which, Can which Conservatives voted against. Uh, we stepped up uh, with help so that all families can send their kids to the dentist. Unfortunately, Conservatives stood against that too. No wonder they'd talk about anything else other than their abandonment of the middle class. We're going to continue to be there to support Canadians throughout. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Selkirk Interlake Eastman. Another bad answer from a random Liberal. So after eight years of this Prime Minister, Canadians are struggling like they've never had before. But if you're a Liberal lobbyist or a high-priced consultant, it's never been better. For the fifth time, these Liberals have been found guilty of breaking our ethics laws twice by this Prime Minister. This time, the Trade Minister was caught shoveling money to her good friend and CBC pundit, Amanda Alvaro, who is also on the Trade Minister's campaign team. Will the Prime Minister fire this Trade Minister and make her pay back the $17,000 he gave to her BFF? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Minister has taken full responsibility and apologized. Honourable yeah. Member for Brampton and North. Wow. Quantum science and technologies have incredible untapped potential in fields as diverse as drug design, climate forecasting, navigation, and clean technology. Canada is a world leader in quantum, and we know that additional investments in this innovative sector will help foster even more cutting-edge research and innovation. Can the Prime Minister kindly update this House how investments in quantum lead to economic growth and job creation? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague from Brampton North for her question and her hard work. Last week, I was immensely pleased to be able to visit Toronto's Xanadu Quantum Technologies, Incorporated. Through our federal investment, their new quantum computing project is expected to create three, 530 new highly skilled positions. Whether it's projects like the one at Xanadu or the companies across the country I visited whose workers are building electric vehicles and batteries, we're creating and securing well-paying jobs uh, that help grow the Canadian economy for all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Instead of spending $100 million to help Canadians, the Prime Minister spent $100 million to give contracts to his friends at McKinsey. This is millions of dollars to a firm that advised American hospitals how to maximize profits by billing sick patients. This is the firm that advised Purdue Pharma how to sell more opioids. Why is the Prime Minister spending millions of dollars on his friends rather than spending on helping Canadians through this difficult time? Here, here. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the opioid epidemic is heartbreaking for Canadians right across the country, which is why we've consistently stepped up uh, with evidence-based policy uh, around protecting Canadians, of moving this into a public health uh, space rather than a criminal justice space where the Conservatives continue to want it to be. Uh, we know there is more to invest. There is more support for our frontline workers. There's more support for vulnerable Canadians uh, living with addiction right across the country. We will continue to be there working with our colleagues in the provinces and territories and municipalities uh, to support Canadians with the best science and evidence there to support them. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the budget is in the drafting stage, I remind the Prime Minister of previous Liberal election promises as a useful guide. For example, reduce spending by stopping spending on fossil fuel infrastructure, cancel the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline, cancel the purchases of the F-35 fighter jets, cancel the fossil fuel subsidies across Canada, and deliver on promises on pharmacare, fund the disability benefit, fund an independent Canada Water Agency, deliver on promises Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Will the Prime Minister use this budget to deliver on his promises? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are facing a difficult time right now, uh, which is why we're going to continue to be there for them, investing in them responsibly to make it through these tough times and get uh, to the brighter future ahead. We know that our investments in uh, building uh, a cleaner economy and good jobs that go with it, our investments uh, in reconciliation, our investments uh, in science uh, and in research are all things that are helping Canadians through these difficult times, uh, and we will continue uh, to put Canadians at the heart of everything we do. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for question period today. I wish to draw the attention of members to the presence in the gallery of the Honourable...